All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Today we are diving into a topic that's been getting a lot of attention, especially in the social media and wellness communities. And that topic is leaky gut syndrome. So while leaky gut syndrome is not a formally recognized medical diagnosis, many people are curious about its potential like a digestive health and especially for the chronic inflammatory state. So let's explore this topic together. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to explain what is leaky gut, what is the epithelial barrier or the lining of the gut and what happens for it to become le leaky. Then we'll look at the mechanisms and finally we'll look at some of the uh, management approaches as well. So with this, let's start. There are situations when epithelial barrier of the intestine becomes permeable leading to various diseases which can be called leaky gut syndrome. To understand the, the leaky gut, first of all, what we have to understand is that there is a uh, lining of the intestine. So if you look into your mouth, the cells that are lining the, the lumen or the cavity of the mouth, these cells are called epithelial cells. Our intestinal structure, the wall, is made up of many, many layers. So the most internal layer, this layer, that I am drawing on right now. This is the inner lining cells that are facing the lumen. Lumen being the, the hollow cavity of the intestine. So the cells that are facing this side are called epithelial cells. Actually, all of our surface cells anywhere on our body are called epithelial cells. For example, eyes surface is conjunctiva, that is epithelial, nose, mouth, the whole GIT, then reproductive system lining, then the urinary system linings, the skin, these are all epithelial cells. Here in the GIT, these cells that are making this lining are set to form an epithelial barrier, intestinal epithelial barrier. The job of this barrier is to prevent various molecules and toxins and pathogens to enter deeper into the wall of the intestine. Whatever is received inside the wall can then get into the circulation through the blood supply of the GIT. Now, our body has a mechanism. So if I go here to this diagram, imagine that these are two epithelial cells. Our body has a mechanism or a way to bind the epithelial cells together so that the gap between them is reduced. That gap always stays and the gap is sufficient to allow water and some electrolytes to move through that. However, majority of the content that we are digesting and absorbing, that would pass through the cell. So it would enter the cell first and then it would enter behind the cell into the circulation. So that passage will be called intracellular passage. And the passage of anything that is around the cells through those gaps between the cell will be called extracellular or paracellular passage. There are a number of proteins that bind the cells together. So for example, we have occludins or claudins or zonula occludins, or we have GP120 cadherins or we have desmosomes. These are proteins that would stitch two cells together. Imagine you put a rope in one cell and you pull it into the other cell and then you pull the cells together. These proteins are making what is called tight junction. So they would bind the cells together so tightly that the gap between the cell is reduced almost to nothing and only water and some electrolytes can pass through this. Knowing this, there is another very important thing to consider, and that is that this gap between the cells, the paracellular spaces, or the tight junctions that are present here, they are not always constantly closed, or they are not always constantly open. In fact, the situation within the cell and the content of the gut lumen plus the immune cells that are present beneath these cells or outside of these cells, all of those factors can influence the current state 
of this gap or the junction. So you can think of this junction as a living uh, space that increases or reduces in its size depending upon the needs of the body. Now, of course, if there is an imbalance in these regulatory influences, then what happens is that this barrier can become compromised. So if I go to the next diagram over here, and yes, I have Luffy here roaming around as well. Imagine that there is some pathogen present in the gut that is releasing lipopolysaccharides, which are one of the toxins released by bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. And that lipopolysaccharide is causing irritation and is causing damage. Or maybe lipopolysaccharide is causing an immune cell to become activated, which in turn releases the chemical substances that can then attack these junctions and can cause these junctional proteins or tight junction proteins to become damaged. When they will become damaged, there will be a greater space, abnormal space that will be produced between these cells. So of course, when that happens, that would cause various toxins and other bacteria to start seeping through these gaps and get in the intestinal wall. Once they are there, what will happen is that the immune cells over here, they would react to these toxins and they would cause inflammation. That inflammation would further exacerbate the situation because the inflammatory molecules themselves can cause damage to the tight junction proteins, making the gut further leaky. As the toxins start entering in the gut wall, from there they will be swept away by blood circulation and brought in to the rest of the body, which in turn can cause systemic diseases. So what are the general uh, factors that can cause intestinal epithelial barrier integrity compromise? Mouthful meaning which can make this gut leaky. So there can be environmental stresses, there can be pathogens, there can be genetic susceptibility of a person. Western diet has many inflammatory components that can then attack this area cause local immune cells to become activated and then the uh, chemical molecules released by the inflammatory uh, the immune cells can then cause damage to these as well. Similarly, altered microbiota. Our colon and rectal area is filled with microbiome, the pathogens that are helping us. Some of them are not very helpful too, but mostly the dominant bacteria are the one that are helping. If that microbiota becomes altered, for example, you travel to another area and there is a different microbiota over there, or if there is unhealthy microbiota that comes in with some food, that alteration can cause a problem with the epithelial barrier compromising it. Similarly, taking various drugs can do the, the compromise of the integrity of the epithelial barrier. Antibiotics can do that. Immune responses can do that as well. So as I said, there can be toxins or there can be irritants in our food that we eat, which can then activate the immune cells of the gut lining, which would then cause release of the chemical substances causing the damage to the, uh, causing inflammation. And one outcome is leaky gut. So to give you an example, in a recent study from China, the researchers noted that a gram negative bacteria called Prevotella can release lipopolysaccharides in the intestinal lumen. And those lipopolysaccharides, they have a dual action. On one end, if there is inflammation of the gut because of some other factors, as I said before, like for example, let's say microbiota is changed. And that inflammation has caused the intracellular spaces to become opened. That Prevotella releases lipopolysaccharides, which can then pass through these cells enter the blood circulation, these lipopolysaccharides from the Prevotella can then cross the blood-brain barrier as well. And when they enter the brain tissue, inside the brain tissue, they can activate the brain's immune system cells, which are called glial cells. Those glial cells, when once they become active, they do not know that I have we have any issue within the brain. They just know they got activated. So what they do is they start damaging the neurons around them in an attempt to try to help them. And that actually increases the risk of dementia. So the researchers found that a higher amount 
of Prevotella present in the gut can lead to, if it is combined with gut inflammation and some leaky gut-like situation, then that can lead to increased risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease. On the other hand, Prevotella has, this is just a side note for your interest, Prevotella has another very interesting behavior that in the gut cells, for example, natural killer cells, which are immune cells present in the gut and present in other parts of the body as well, and macrophages and dendritic cells of the gut, the Prevotella's lipopolysaccharide is structured in such a way that it causes these cells to modulate the toll like receptor. Toll like receptors are receptors present on macrophages, dendritic cells and other cells that look at pathogen associated molecular patterns or various harmful substances. And Prevotella's lipopolysaccharide acts on these cells and reduces their tolerance or kind of suppresses them from reacting to these other harmful substances and reduces the gut inflammation, which reduces the risk of colorectal cancer. So it is an interesting situation. That means if we want to have the reduced risk of colorectal cancer by improving our gut microbiome, by having more Prevotella, then we also have to make sure that our inflammatory state of the GIT is not heightened because that would cause leaky gut and that would cause the LPS to go to brain. So that means anti-inflammatories should be combined so that the uh, LPS do not go to brain. So th this is just one example. Inflammation of the gut because of the other microbiome present or toxins present, which then lead to increased permeability of intestinal epithelial barrier can be, can contribute to ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, etc. Similarly, metabolic endotoxemia. Metabolic endotoxemia is when there are the endotoxins or let's say harmful substances present in the food will then go through these paracellular spaces, through these leaky tight junctions and enter our gut's wall or even circulation and body. These can cause inflammation, chronic inflammation, if that situation continues in our body, inflammation of the gut plus presence of these endotoxins that can lead to obesity and diabetes. Similarly, leakage of metabolic endotoxins can also give rise to systemic diseases, as I just mentioned one, for example, Alzheimer's. So then we reach the point of saying, understood, <laughs> how do we now try to help this situation. So of course, the very first one is that we figure out what is causing the gut inflammation. A lot of carbohydrates can do that. Sometimes various food content can irritate our gut. And it is also interesting that the same thing that would irritate one person will not irritate another. So everybody's gut is uniquely responsive to various content that it receives and the microbiome that is present and the immune system cells that are present in the gut. And of course, for that, one has to work with the doctor to figure out what is going on, what is the primary cause of the gut inflammation, and then work on it. Having said that, now the, the list that I'm going to uh, present here, please do not use this list without your doctor's recommendation or discussing with them. However, it is noted, and those studies in which these are noted are linked in the description of this video. It is noted that there are some drugs that can either reduce the inflammation or they can improve the junction or tight junction protein integrity. They even can help the tight junction proteins to be produced more so that they are present and they're keeping the cells tightly bound to each other. What are some of those drugs? Metformin is one of them. Butyrates is another or are another. Berberine is another, which is very, very important. Berberine is also used for uh, re reducing inflammation. It is also used for uh, diabetes. Microbiota transplant, regulating the intestinal flora, probiotic supplements, exercise, diet composition, improving the diet composition, intermittent fasting and controlling the rhythm of the content that is entering the, diet, entering the intestine. Then the diets that are rich in polyphenols, fibers, have appropriate vitamins, especially antioxidants that reduce the inflammation. 
Similarly, diets that are energy restricted, that do not create an explosion of the energy and as a result, reactive oxygen species are being produced, which then cause inflammation, which then leads to in increased permeability of the intestinal epithelial barrier or in general terms, leaky gut, resulting in diseases that would call, will be called leaky gut syndrome. So these are some of the ways to improve our gut, to avoid leaky gut and to strengthen the gut the gut lining so with this thank you very much for watching thank you for watching please like subscribe and share and i would see you again the links to all of these description these uh, studies that i used for this talk they are present in the description of this video also if you would like to support this work the links are present in the description as well with this thank you and see you again